Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. Those of you who have a seat, there are several seats still available. Those of you who have a seat available next to you, please raise your hand, and we will have someone come and, and sit next to you. We're asking that you would be neighborly and welcome them with a smile. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You should see yourselves. You look great. You ought to give yourselves a round of applause. There are many places you could be on a Thursday night in April. We are thankful that you decided to join us for the second installment of the Mayor's Public Safety Forum. Uh, our first forum was held in the Western District. And tonight we are in the what district? Eastern. All right, say that again. Eastern. That's what's up. Those of you who live in the Eastern District, why don't you give yourselves a round of applause? Eastern. That's right, that's okay. It's great to be proud about your neighborhood. How many are actually originally from the Eastern District? Raise your hand. That's awesome, that's awesome. So tonight we are here to hear from the most important people in the room, and that is you. Uh, but we also have with us uh, Mayor Rawlings Blake, who will be, sure, you can give her a round of applause, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. And in a moment, you'll also be hearing from our fine commissioner, Commissioner Anthony Batts. Yeah. And I will uh, let the mayor acknowledge the elected officials who are joining with us tonight. But it is my duty to first, again, welcome you and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, again, this is the mayor's second installment of the Public Safety Forum here in the Eastern District. We are very proud to be here tonight. Many of you are faces that we met during canvassing opportunities. We've knocked on your door. Uh, we heard some of your questions and concerns. Some of you were actually kind enough to even send us some emails. Um, stating that there are topics that you wish for us to cover tonight. So we're going to try to cover all of those topics. We're going to try to make sure we pass the Q&A section on to you as quickly as possible. So first, I would like to introduce the president of the Community Relations Council, uh, Ms. Charlene Boone, Bourne, who is with us. And I just would like for you to just stand up. <laughs> Ms. Bourne, I'm going to hand you the mic. And I'm a, you can get the mic. And just ask you to give greetings and welcome everyone into your district. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is wonderful to see us out here tonight representing the great Eastern District. I just want to make sure that you get all your questions out. This is our opportunity to address our concerns. So I look forward to hearing all of our concerns because I know we have them. Thank you very much. I would like to also encourage you, and she didn't take the opportunity, and it's fine, but I'm going to give a plug for the CRC in the Eastern District. If you are not a part of the CRC and you have not attended uh, their monthly meeting, now is the time to certainly leave your name in the back. Uh, and I'm sure that she would welcome you as a member and certainly as a visitor to her meeting. Go ahead. You can do it. We meet the fourth Tuesday of every month at Eastern District Roll Call Room. The meeting is not my meeting, it is our meeting. It's a time for us to come out and meet with our command staff of our district and for us to be able to work together to solve problems we have. Thank you again, Ms. Bourne. Bourne as in Bourne Identity, the movie. Right. I'll now hand it over to uh, our very fine and capable mayor, Mayor Rawlings. Blake, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Gus. First, I want to thank all the residents for coming out. I know that we have been relentless in our uh, canvassing in your community, and I want to thank you for uh, your cooperation. I know sometimes you're probably like, who is this knocking on my door? Uh, and it was us, and I appreciate you answering the call and uh, being here today. I also want to thank the members of the City Council who are here with us today. I'm going to start in the back of the room with uh, City Councilman Carl Stokes, 
Thank you very much for being here. I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, Senator Nathaniel McFadden, who has been, uh, you know, I, I would say the wind beneath my wings in Annapolis. He's been amazing. In so many ways, uh, Senator, you have uh, quietly, but with uh, an amazing determination, ensured that the, the legislative package and our interests uh, were uh, covered in Annapolis in a way that only you could, and I want to thank you. We've had, if you take a look at the last four years, I don't know of another four-year span where the Baltimore delegation has done more, and I want to thank you for your uh, leadership. Uh, whether it's reforming the liquor board to the $1.1 billion in, in school construction, I could go on and on. Uh, but it, it has been in troubling economic times. It has been an amazing accomplishment, and it has been in large part because of your leadership. So I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, Councilman Branch, who is always on the spot. I want to thank you for your continued partnership uh, you were out there knocking on doors with me, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as the chair of the Public Safety Committee, I know that uh, this is something that's very important uh, to you. I also uh, want to uh, thank the, co the, the vice chair of uh, the Public Safety Committee, uh, City Councilman Brandon Scott, who is with us today. Brandon Scott recently just turned 30 years old. <laughs> So his, you know, he, some of the shine is coming off. You know, he's he's not the he's not the the, the pretty young thing. I'm just joking with you. you. Know, I'm just joking with you. I don't know, uh, Councilman, if you wanted to say something as well. You sure? You can come back at me. You know, I've been teasing you all week about turning 30. All right. And. <laughs> And I, I really want to thank your, your uh, CRC uh, president. You have done an amazing job. Uh, thank you for helping us. Mr. Glenn, thank you for helping us to make sure that we had uh, people here at the meeting. It's very important. Um, you know, one of our colleagues, Councilman Branch and uh, Councilman Stokes and Councilman Scott, one of our colleagues on the council, uh, Councilman Ricky Spector, always says, you don't ask the doctor if the medicine is working, you ask the patient. And the only way that we're going to know that we're getting this right isn't because I'm telling you anything. One of the reporters asked me, what are you going to tell, the, peop tell you know, the people who've come out? I said, it's not about me telling anything. It's about me listening and trying to figure out how we can work better together. Uh, because e there's no reason why you would be here this evening if you did not have your community at heart, if you did not want it better for your neighborhood and for your city. And I stand here as a partner uh, to make sure that we're able to do that. I, s I also stand here with our police commissioner, who is uh, working tirelessly. Uh, and, you know, I'm so very proud, Commissioner Batts. We had, um, you know, b before, uh, before Councilman uh, Scott was born was the last time we had single-digit homicide uh, rates for, the, for a month, before he was even born. And we were able to do that under your leadership and because of the collaboration we have with the community. And to me, if we can do it, you know, we had a great month in February, we had a better month in March. To me, uh, and unfortunately for you, I expect even better uh, in April. Uh, and and uh, to the, the men and women of the police department, it's because I believe uh, that you deserve better and they can do better. You know, we know the recipe. Uh, we know it's working closely in collaboration. Uh, we know the, the enforcement strategy that works, and we know by continuing to work together, we will uh, make Baltimore a much safer city. I think we also know that uh, something that the commissioner and I uh, had a meeting of the minds on uh, during the interview process was that not every person that is on the street is a problem. Not every person who the police interact with is a suspect. And because, of, because he had a like mind, you know, we knew that we had to do things differently. We had to focus on that small group of people. And if we're all to be honest, we know who they, they are. We know who they are statistically. We have the data. But you know who they are because you know them. A small group of people who are causing 
the vast majority of problems in our community. And by focusing on that small group of people who we know are repeat violent offenders, I, we know uh, that we can continue to, to make Baltimore uh, a safer uh, community. And I knew, and I talked about this, and uh, Commissioner can attest to this when we uh, first met. I said, I know that we cannot come to the community. I couldn't stand here and, and extend my hand and ask you to join me in the efforts and the, in, the, in the fight to make Baltimore a safer city if when you went home you felt like you were under siege. I knew, I knew that wouldn't work. So we had to figure out a way to do something different. And it was that meeting of the minds that brought Commissioner Batts here. And it was also with that understanding that I took a second look at Operation Ceasefire. You know, Operation Ceasefire supports uh, our efforts to focus on repeat violent offenders. And it has shown great promise in other cities around the country. And it's done it because it's done two things. We focused on repeat violent offenders in the way that we've done uh, with our expanded enforcement zones, meaning we're serious. You know, we, we've already, in, in the, after the uh, Eastern District Public Safety Initiative, um, you know, we took almost 30 people off the streets mm -hmm. that has had a significant uh, impact on reducing uh, public, I mean, reducing violence in, in the impacted zone that we had our public safety initiative. Um, but so we're going to continue that focus. And it's not just on the enforcement. It's not just on removing them. The, the, the thing that ceasefire does is say that if you want to turn your life around, if you want different, we stand in partnership with you for that. And we will help you with the resources that you need to turn your life around. But if you are intent to continue the mayhem, continue the violence, continue the disrespect to yourself and to your community, we will come down on you with everything that we have. And we're going to come down on you and everybody that's associated with you until you understand and everybody out on the street understands that is enough is enough, that we want more for ourselves and for our children than the violence that we've seen on our street. You saw a little bit of that uh, after Officer McNeil was shot. I mean, the, the, all of the, uh, every resource we had, whether it was from the city, the state, uh, came down and was able to, uh, you know, put the pressure on the young man who turned himself in. And that's a, a, gl a glimpse into what uh, the ceasefire is capable of. It is, you know, by focusing on the individual, but it's also with a, with a group consequence. So whatever the individual does, the, the group pays for if the if the individual and the group want better for their lives, we're all in to help change you know to to change the trajectory. But if they don't, uh, we're going to um, enforce the laws to the to the fullest extent, and uh, they'll know that that we're serious. But in order for this to work, uh, we have to continue to have community input. Uh, we have to continue to have the progress that we've had. Last year, we had over 300 percent increase in citizen participation or citizen information coming to the police department. That's major for me. You know, to, to come from a, a place where, you know, the stop snitching was the norm, where not talking to the police was a norm to where we had 300 percent increase is a significant improvement. And I know that we can do uh, more and we can do better. Uh, that's why I it was important to me in, in this year's budget, and I talked about it in my State of the City address, it was important that I increase the reward money available through Metro Crimes, Crime Stoppers. You know, I know that there, there are things that pull on people when they have to make the decision on whether or not to give information. And I don't mind, and, and we don't mind, giving people the incentive to do what they know that they need to do. Because sometimes people just act in pure self-interest. And $500 or $1,000 is just what they need uh, to come forward. And I don't have a problem with that, as long as it leads us to getting guns off the street. So, you know, if, you know, with the uh, police commissioner, we are working to improve, increase the amount of funds that are going to Metro's Crime Stoppers so we can increase the 
amount of money that's going if you turn in someone and it leads to a conviction for an illegal gun. So I understand, I understand that this is a, com this is a collaborative effort in order for us to have increased public safety and confidence in uh, public safety, you know, not just for a month or two, but over the long haul, I, over the long haul, I understand it. And I also know that it's more than just the police. It's about working on the whole community. We started that work with the public safety initiative in the Eastern District, and we maintained a lot of that work. Uh, we brought every agency we had, including our, uh, uh, our non-government partners, to, talk, to take a look at many of the communities, specifically the Oliver community, and how we can work together to improve the conditions in that community. And uh, one of the things that came out of it in the community fair was an emphasis on job training and, com and connecting individuals to jobs. That's very important to me. Uh, we have to continue to do that work, and I have. Uh, I know uh, that there are many people in our city who, while you know, some people in the country, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, are making. You know, you, you hear it on the news that the CEOs are making more money than anybody can ever think, you know, to, to know what to do with. But there are so many of us that are being left behind, and that's where I've asked the mayor's, my office of employment development, to focus. We have one office, one um, one-stop career uh, center that's strictly focused on individuals with records. Individuals who know going in the door, they have obstacles to employment. And we have not just that career center, but uh, community job hubs throughout the city who are working with individuals to try to connect them to job uh, opportunities. It is very important to me because you cannot expect someone that does not have a way to uh, take care of themselves or their, their families not to be vulnerable. You know that if someone cannot provide for themselves and for their family, they are vulnerable to slide back into the behaviors that got them into trouble for the first, in the first place. So that's why we continue to make those in, investments. And I want to thank uh, all, of the, the, all three of the council members who are here who have uh, continued to support my budget that uh, directs uh, resources to our training efforts and uh, the collaborative work we do with employers to make sure that we're connecting people to jobs as well. So um, I know I've gone probably way over, uh, but I, I did want to convey those things to you and just express my sincere gratitude for each and every one of you for being here this evening. Thank you very much. The Madam Mayor doesn't get to say that she goes over. She kind of sets the tone, so I, I uh, give her some of my time. How are you guys doing tonight? That is so weak. How are you guys doing tonight? Ms. Terry, you doing okay back there? We're saying happy birthday to you. You having a good day? Do you guys know Ms. Terry had a birthday today? <laughs> I embarrassed her earlier today. I thank you all for coming out, and I want this to, to, to be light. I want this to be interesting, uh, and as the mayor said, is that we're here to learn. We're not here to speak at you, talk to you, but to hear, to understand, and your wishes and in, in the things that you want out of your organization are the imperatives that become the driving mission of this police department. I want to build an organization that's cust uh, that is customer driven, which means that we don't tell the community what they should be doing. The community tells us what they what we should be doing, and that you pay our salaries and, our, and our, your tax dollars go to our salaries, so we provide service to you. I have to start with an apology, and I always have to start with an apology. And my apology is I sincerely apologize that I didn't go to Dunbar, I didn't go to Mervo, I didn't go to Poly. Uh, I didn't go to Digital Harbor or Calvert Hall. I'm sorry, and I didn't go to Frederick Douglass City. I apologize. I'm telling you now on the front end. You know, I, I was born in Washington, D.C., and my family, my family matric I'm sorry. My family matriculated to the west, uh, to the west coast, and I grew up in uh, South Central Los Angeles in a very poor environment, very dysfunctional environment dealing with things of uh, a lot of the things that we deal with in, in our community here. And the reason that that's important, the reason that I, that's clear that I start with that, is that this is the third city that I've been in charge of. This is the third major city that has a large diverse population with a large minority community that this time around, the last two cities, I got to choose where I, I got to work. Uh, even in the first one, I got to choose that department. I was there 28 years, but I got to choose 
where I wanted to work. And one of the reasons that I picked the city of Baltimore, number one, the size, the diversity, the populations, but also I got the opportunity to work for this lady. And I mean that in all honesty, and I'm not saying it because I'm trying to stroke her or win points along those lines. But uh, when I did the research coming to this city, when I had the opportunity to choose where I wanted to go and work, what she wants to do, what she's trying to do, and she, gets, she takes a lot of blows, but then I get to sit and I get to talk to her, and I know from behind doors, not, not in front of audiences, that I have a conversation, and I call strikes and balls. I don't play. I'm at that stage that I don't have to play. I don't have to, to play games, and I don't have to cater. She's the real deal. She, she wants to make the city better. She's working herself into the ground to make the city better. Please give her a round of applause for the job that she does. I mean that in sincerity. You have, and I say that because you have no idea what she does and what she has to deal with to move this city ahead. This is not an easy, easy city in, in no context. And you have to be strong and you have to be, have, have the passion to push forward. You know, one of the things that, that I say to police officers, and I say it on a regular basis, and I mean this sincerely, and I have said this in the 12 years that, that I've led police agencies, I tell them, if you do a good job and you make a mistake, I will defend you because that's what we get, to, we get to do as human beings. We make mistakes. And I have 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, 23-year-olds, 23, 23 and I even have some 30-year-olds uh, who are out there doing, doing the job on, on, a reg, on a regular basis. And they get to make mistakes because that happens sometimes. If they make a small mistake out of the goodness of their heart, I will defend them. I will support them. I will even lose my job if it takes that to defend these officers if they're doing the right things for the right reason. And I say that clearly. I say it in front of my bosses. I say it in front of TV. I say it in front of you. At the same time, if I have an officer here that out of the malice of their heart that they hurt this community, that they hurt the residents of this community, I will hold them accountable. And I have no, no problems with that. I've given awards to off. I've, I've hired thousands, literally thousands of police officers over my career. I've given a lot of awards for courage in the things that they've done, but I've also put handcuffs on police officers too. And like I said, I call strikes and I call balls. If we do a good job, I will tell you we did a good job and stand for it. If we make mistakes and we make errors, I'll tell you that too, and I'll be straightforward. Because when I have to say the sky is falling, for me, you have to know the sky is falling. And I don't play those games for anybody or for any reason, so I stand tall behind that. You know, what I'm trying to do here, and then I'm going to introduce my command staff and sit down and take your questions, is that I did a strategic plan with the direction of the mayor to set out a plan that you knew exactly what this police department was doing, one. Number two, you know how to hold me accountable for what I'm trying to accomplish in, the, in your organization. And the most important part, it was based on what you said you want this police department to do. That's what that strategic plan is built on. Not what I think, not what I think we should do, but the residents of this community said, this is what's important to us, this is what we want you to do, and that's what we're building this police department on. And what I have to say out of that strategic plan, we're not on target. I have to be honest, from, from the expectations of this community, we're not on target. And we have to readjust the organization. That doesn't say that we have a bad police department. It doesn't say that we have bad police officers. That's not the case. What is saying that out of the expectations of this community, we're not in alignment with them. And so part of what we are doing through leadership is aligning this organization with the needs of this community. With that, the, the strategic plan has three major points, and they're the three C's. They deal with crime. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the shootings and the homicides, because those are extremely important. And that is clear from the mayor. That is the focus and the number one goal of this police organization. And from the community, that's clear that's number one. But we also have to deal with what I think is important, is if a woman has, the, has the, the potentiality of being hit in the head, drugged down an alley, and raped, that's important to me. Someone breaking into your house, that's important to me. Somebody breaking into your car, that's important to me. You're, you're, and I can sit up here and talk about numbers, but if you don't feel safe walking down our streets, then that's an issue for me. And that's what I need to pay attention to. So we have a, a strategic plan covering crime, all parts of crime in all parts of community. Community, what the community has to say is job number one, and credibility. I don't have any tolerance for scandals. I have no tolerance for police officers that do wrong. So the three points of that, that strategic plan, crime, community, credibility. That's our focus, that's our mission, that's where we're going. What I like to do now is actually uh, give the opportunity for the guys who actually get the job done you get to see me on TV, little short bald-headed guy from California who didn't graduate from Mervo or Dunbar. 
but uh, for the guys who do the job on a regular basis. When I walked in, one of the first meetings that I had was at the Eastern. And one of the first persons I, that I got to, to meet uh, was Charlene Bourne. Charlene uh, was at a meeting that uh, I started at, I think, at 9 o'clock at night. And they didn't let me walk out till like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning. And I had just flown in for a couple days to be introduced by the mayor. And they, they, they said, you have to listen. You're not going anywhere. We haven't finished talking to you. And so Charlene has become a friend. To the, and this is how I'm trying to change this organization. Charlene just came in uh, with us uh, probably about three weeks ago. Part of what I'm trying to do is get this community to be a part of the police department and have a say in it. She sat on the promotional boards for all future majors that are coming up for promotion. So we have lieutenants and captains that came before this board. Charlene was one of uh, our proctors that were on this test taking process. And she got to rate the people who are getting promoted to the jobs that are going forth. Why is that important? I want people in jobs that understand that this community is job number one, that they're important. And if you don't believe in this community, if you're not connected to this community, we don't want you in high positions. You have to put the, the community job one. And when I was at that same meeting, I met a, a major who was there who was running the Eastern District. And um, I was very touched by the things that he had done in the Eastern District. And so when I came out, I promoted him to Lieutenant Colonel. And he stepped into position, and I said, take what you did in Eastern and, and bring in the police department closer to the community, and I want you to do it citywide. So Lieutenant Colonel Mel Russell, in charge of our Neighborhood Partnership Division. Yeah. And then after, after I moved him out of that position, I had to replace that job. And I had to put him in, put another person who cared just as much and had just the, the solid skill base that he had, had back in the Eastern, because I know how important that district is to the city as a whole. And I, put a gentleman, I pulled a gentleman out of uh, the EOC job and said, I'm sticking you in the Eastern, and I want you to knock him dead. And that's exactly what he's done. He's done an excellent job. Keith Matthews. <laughs> Another gen gentleman that we put in charge of our command staff, Brandon. Oh, it's not the councilman. OK. <laughs> I did it. I take pride. I was going to say, Councilman Brandon Scott, he's part of our family here. But uh, what I, the next gentleman that uh, I'm, <laughs> the next gentleman that uh, I promoted, and, and I say that with pride because I've had the, I had the privilege of promoting every one of these gentlemen that I'm going to introduce to you. But I'm also going to go around, and I take a great deal of pride in that because what I'm trying to choose is not people based on if they kiss my posterior. I'm promoting people who are based on their merit based on their skill, based on the fact that they love this community and they want to turn it around. And I promoted, I took a gentleman out of the Northeast who was a, who was a uh, major there, and I promoted him twice. Colonel Daryl D'Souza, in charge of patrol. <laughs> I guess I must like him because I promoted him twice in 18 months, so I think he's, he must be doing a good job. There's another gentleman that I, that I took as I came in. I came in. I had to make a very tough decision when I, when I walked into this, into this organization, and it very much affected this area. And one of the tough decisions, one of the many tough decisions that I had to make in there is that there was, a, there was a piece of our organization that was very much responsible for dropping the crime rate in the city. About, uh, they were very responsible for getting us down to 197 homicides. But at the same time, that unit was also responsible for a high rate of uh, citizen complaints throughout the city as a whole. So what I had to do is come in there and dismantle that unit. I had to remove the, the leadership of that unit. I had to uh, move it out. I had to make some arrest within that unit because people were doing things that were illegal and they should not have been done. So I, I had to arrest them and I had to disband the unit as a whole. That's part of the reason that our homicide rate was up last year because that unit was very valuable. But for me, the ends just not, does not justify the means. And just because we're, we're pushing very hard, you don't get, get to do that the wrong way. We're building a constitutional police department that respects the civil rights of all citizens in, in this community. So when I put it back together and I replaced the leadership of that unit, I put a gentleman from uh, throughout the organization who was a fixer. His name is Cliff McWhite. Yes, <laughs> Cliff have, has moved, moved around in many different positions fixing things. I then, uh, after moving him in that position, I promoted him to lieutenant colonel, and he's in charge of the entire western side of our city. The next gentleman came from the Southern District, who's done a dynamite job of taking a district that was a little problematic when he took it over, calmed it down, got rid of the problems, got rid of the issues, opened himself up to the community, and the community loved him. But I promoted him to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and put him in charge of detectives, Dave Reese. Yes, sir. 
I uh, also, when I came in, when we were, when officers have misconduct, we have basically have to put on a trial or a trial board. I brought in a new, uh, two new guys. Uh, one of the guys is not here, Deputy Commissioner Rodriguez, who I brought with me from the West Coast, uh, who's another guy who uh, play, who uh, calls strikes and balls and doesn't play. Uh, he's kind of like a pit bull, and I told him. We're not going to have any any nonsense within this organization. Go seek it out, go find it, and go rip it out. And uh, he's not here today, but he does a good job, Deputy Commissioner Rodriguez. And behind him, yes, give him a round of applause because he works hard. You see him on TV often. Behind him, I brought a, a gentleman who uh, used to uh, actually uh, uh, prosecute cases uh, against police officers for misconduct. That was his job. Uh, for the city. He prosecuted police officers and I stole him away from there and I made him, I put him in charge of my internal affairs. Uh, Chief Rodney Hills all the way in the back. <laughs> and uh, is there any other members of the command staff that I'm missing that I don't want to be embarrassed that I, I go over someone? Captain Steve Ward. Captain. And uh, Captain Steve Ward in charge of the East Dist Eastern District is very responsible for uh, responding to crime. <laughs> And the person who keeps me on track all the time and, and uh, tells me if I say something wrong up here and she gives me the eye, my chief of staff, Ganesha Martin. Thank you, Commissioner. So before we move forward and move on, I just want to acknowledge that there are at least four seats within my eyesight. If you have a seat, an available seat open next to you, just raise your hand and we'll have some folks uh, fill it. I will ask the camera uh, crew to forgive us for th those folks that need to walk by. Uh, again, those of you who are standing who are in need of a seat, we have one, two, three, four, at least four seats available, and you can make your way to having a seat. Uh, Madam Mayor, if I may, I just wanted to acknowledge a few of the uh, agencies that are with us tonight as well uh, as added resources. You referenced uh, both seats fire and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we have uh, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Ms. Angela Jonice, who is joining us with her staff. <laughs> the Director of the Ceasefire Program, Mr. LeVar Michael, is actually in the back. Just if you want to raise your hand, put a face to the name of the program. There's another gentleman, Kevin Cleary, who is here. He is the community manager. There he is. He's actually uh, operating the public safety initiative right now. And we have representatives from Recreation and Parks with us tonight. Those of you who are seated should have received the brochure from Rec and Parks. And we also have Mr. Eric Booker. We call him Chief Booker from Code Enforcement, who is with us tonight. Yes, sir. So there are three people who are here. One that we heard from earlier, and that is, again, Ms. Charlene Bourne, who is president of the CRC. Uh, I would like to also introduce Mr. Glenn Ross. Many of you know Glenn, who is joining us this evening. If you would just stand and wave your hand, Mr. Ross of McElderry Park. He actually joined us on Saturday in our canvassing efforts as we uh, put the word out about the event tonight. And also from the New Broadway East, Miss Terry Booker. If you could just raise your hand and stand up and acknowledge everyone. These folks, those three that I just introduced, have been very adamant partners in joining us in our effort of, get one, getting the word out, two, hearing from them and their constituents uh, Miss Andrea Curley, who is in the back. She's the liaison, <laughs> mayor's liaison for the Eastern District, um, has been attending meetings, uh, hearing from you, the resident, what your concerns are. Uh, many of the community presidents gave us a list of questions that they would like, or I should say a list of topics that they would like to have addressed and we have with us. And we have on the right, my right, your left-hand side of the room, Mr. Larry Nunley who's the Southwest Community Liaison Senior uh, Representative. When I say Senior Representative, he's the Mayor's Point Person for Seniors in the City of Baltimore. Why don't you again give him a hand? So the state of play is Ms. Curley and Mr. Nunley both have microphones in their hand, cordless mics. Uh, after we hear a question being posed from either, from the three uh, community representatives that are in the front, these are the leaders in the, some of the community uh, associations and, of course, president of the Community Relations Council. They will pose a question. 
give the mayor or the commissioner an opportunity to answer, and then, then we will open the floor up to two questions, one on each side or in the center, to ask a question, and then we will go back to one of the community presidents. We have an opportunity for everyone to pose their question, but there are three rules. I like the way the commissioner gave the three C's. I have three R's. We will, one, respect the nature of this process and forum, and we will respect our residents. Can I just get a hand clap for those of you? No resident has a concern more important than the other. Whatever the question is, that's the most important question to them. Secondly, we will give time for response. Respect, give time for response, and give time to hear the available resources. There are folks from other agencies that are here. Those of you who are here should have a, uh, a flyer or a program which also has a survey on the back at the Western we had a great return of surveys. Tonight, there's a table with a box that you can put your survey in. Many of the questions we got for this uh, forum are directly a reflection of the questions that were raised in the surveys at the last forum. Again, respect, time for response, and an opportunity to hear resources that are available. That said, I would like to hand it over now for the first question to be posed by Ms. Charlene Bourne, CRC President for the Eastern District. Please stand. Oh, one last thing, Ms. Bourne, before you stand. Because we have television cameras, I'm asking that when you stand, it's okay to stand and ask your question. But after asking your question, please have a seat for two reasons. One, so that the audience can, one, see the commissioner and mayor respond, and two, so that your co-residents can see the commissioner and mayor respond, those that will be watching via television. The moment you stand up, Bishop Richardson, you will block that camera in the back. Mr. Street, the moment you stand up, you'll be blocking the camera in the back. So when you ask your question, pose it, have a seat, and wait for a response. All right, Ms. Bourne. Commissioner, yes, my friend, yes, <clears throat> could you please address to us the plans for spring, summer foot patrol in Eastern District? The question was, uh, what are we going to do with foot patrols? One of the things that, uh, Mayor, is it okay if I stand over here? One of the things that I get on a regular basis throughout the city as a whole, everyone consistently asks, what are we doing about foot patrols? And everyone enjoys them, and I'm a believer in foot patrols. What I did last year with, with an experiment is that when we graduated a class of uh, police officers, say a class of 40, uh, 45, we took that class and we subdivided them. And their first assignments were walking patrols. And we put them right here on Eastern on Monument, and they were on the Monument Corridor, uh, running the length of the corridor itself from probably about the 1500 to the 16, 2600 block of a Monument was one of the places. The other half we put in the Western, and we put them in, in the Western in one of the tougher neighborhoods off of uh, North Avenue uh, around Fulton. And what I wanted to do was a couple different things. Number one, I wanted them to get used to working with community leaders on a daily basis. I wanted them to get used to speaking to one people and going into business and understanding that the community is the core of the city. And I wanted to build that in on the front end because when they got, when I put them into those police cars, I wanted them to be comfortable getting out of those police cars. And I want them to get out of those police cars. And I pushed that uh, very diligently. <clears throat> Here in the Eastern, they're not waiting for summer They've already started walking, walking beats in, in our zones. And I, I know that because I'm out here in the Eastern a, 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 a great deal. Uh, if you haven't seen me out here, then uh, you haven't been in the right time because I've been out here at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. I spend a tremendous amount of time on this block, <coughs> excuse me, in this district. <coughs> but uh, what we're going to do is, uh, well, I'll, no, I'll get it in a second, Mayor, thank you. Uh, what we're going to do is that uh, we already have a plan that uh, we're putting out on uh, overtime and uh, we're putting out multiple walking beats throughout the city as a whole. Now we won't be able to do every part of the city all the time, but we're gonna rotate. And part of one of the things uh, that we have in, in our crime plan that we started in mid-January that we put out 
One of the things that I noticed in Baltimore is that uh, the criminal element here adapts extremely quickly. And what I mean by that is there's an issue that's taking place on Thursday night at 6 o'clock, and I put officers out there Thursday night at 6 o'clock. They change and they shift and they move it to 4 a.m. on Friday morning. And it only takes about a week or two for them to adapt to the, the strategies that we put out there. So what we've built into our plan going into the spring, going into summer, is that we have what we call a 10-wave plan. We have a wave, then another wave, then another wave, then another wave, then another wave. We have 10 different waves that come one after the other to throw the balance off. So when they adapt to us, we're going to adapt to them. And so to make sure, if there's anybody here that happens to be on the other side that happen to be in this room, I'm just letting you know, we're going to throw you off balance here. And so part of, part of that is going to be those walking beats and rotating walking beats. And we're going to get down to a sergeant and about three officers uh, on, on multiple blocks. We're going to have sergeants and three officers uh, doing focus patrol. Thank you, Commissioner Batts. Any questions on my, to my left? And you're right. There were some folks that, yes, ma'am, you have your hand up. Please give us your name. And then pose your question. Okay. And we can prepare. Is there a question on? So when we're ready to go back, a uh, question on my right. Yes, sir. I got you. I got you. All right. Yes, sir. Mr. Where you are, Larry, is good. Oh, yes, ma'am. My question is she um, was talking about the beats, walking the beats. Yes, ma'am. I patrols. live in East Baltimore, but it you seems to question, me that all the the beats being walked up and the upper part of Miami Street and Lakewood. I live down near um, Dunbar. I live Ashland and Eden Street, Ashland and Central. And we need beats to be walked around that area also. But I don't see it. Keith. This is uh, Keith Matthews, major in charge of the Eastern. Good evening, everybody. You. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, last year we actually had foot officers down in that area. Uh, as it stands right now, and I do have bike officers, uh, believe it or not, who are in the area, Dunbar, uh, and also have foot officers, and I encourage my guys to get out of their cars and engage. So uh, you should be seeing officers on foot in the area, particularly around Gay Street, uh, 633 building, uh, around uh, the Trobe, and down around uh, Gay Street in the whole area. So uh, they are there. Uh, and if they aren't, give me, give my captain a call, and I'll make sure that you see that. Thank, Thank you, Major. You go by her house and visit her and let them know that they're, they're out there. Sure. Go by and visit her? Anyway. Oh, today's your birthday? Oh, happy birthday to you. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> yes, sir. With the black hat on, you can stand up, sir. Introduce yourself and pose your question. Uh, my name. Thank you. My and name then is we're preparing Street. for a question. I'm right on the McGovery Park. My question I'd like to propose is. Can we, the foot patrols are great, but can we get more lighting? Because there are some areas, even a policeman with a gun should not walk down at night. So we need to protect them as well as they need to protect us. So thank you. First, for uh, thank you for knocking on doors with us uh, when, when we went out canvassing in the community. I appreciate you being out there. And one of the things that came out of the public safety initiative was an assessment of, of lighting. So yes. Um, we can uh, do better, and I can say the BG e is at the table with us to, tr at, to try to figure out how we can improve uh, street lighting. So the Department of Transportation and BG, e, it's something that we take seriously. We are we are uh, willing and uh, major if uh, in collaboration with the community and with your officers that are on patrol. Um, I hope you know, but in case you don't, let me just reiterate, if there are areas that, that require temporary lighting until right. we can get lighting, please let us know, because this is about uh, getting the, the best information from the street uh, to improve operations. And it's not, and the commissioner will say, it's not top down. It is getting as close to the information as possible, as close to you as possible. Uh, so we'll certainly work uh, in collaboration to identify those places that you're talking about and match them up with what the po patrol officers are, are experiencing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. We will now go to, and before getting to uh, Ms. Terry Booker, uh, I would like to acknowledge two other uh, agencies, or well, certainly one agency and one commissioner, and that is our fabulous, and y'all forgive me for forgetting to acknowledge you, the Mayor's Youth Commission. Uh, the Youth Commissioners who are joining us in the back. 
a dynamite team of Get It Done. So I just want to thank you. Again, give them a round of applause. Future political leaders of the city of Baltimore, hopefully. And I wanted to acknowledge Miss Tiffany James from the Department of Public Works, who is with us tonight as a representative. So that's another agency. How you doing, Miss James? I didn't see you. I'm sorry. So now we're going to go to Ms. Terry Booker, who would like to pose a question. As I said, one question from one of the community, represent community presidents, and then two questions from the audience. And after Ms. Booker, we're going to head over to the, my far right to get a question from someone on the end. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Question, Commissioner. What are the proper procedures a driver should consider when pulled over by a marked or unmarked police vehicle? Are you trying to tell me you got pulled over? Do you want to have a talk with me a little later? <laughs> you know, I, I had a conversation years ago with uh, my uh, sons, who are grown men now, but uh, uh, they and my daughter too, who's, who's a grown woman. But uh, as as they grew up, uh, and I try to share with them and, I, and share with them, and I also try to share with you what a police officer is thinking about when they pull up to your car. Now, most traffic stops, 95% of them, 98% of them are just routine. Uh, you run a light, you run a stop sign, you do something that uh, an officer pulls you over, and they walk up, and they're, they're going to they're gonna contact you. But every now and then, what you don't know is that a call may have come out that had a general description that looks close to you and in your car. And it may say that you just robbed a liquor store. Now, in your mind, you have no idea that that information has come out there. You have no clue. All you're doing is driving home, and then that little short, bald-headed police officer pulled you over and walked up to your car, right? That's supposed to be a joke. Okay, fine. My timing's off. Anyway, when I, when I walk up to a car, what I was taught in a police academy, and, and I've been doing this stuff for over three decades, what I was taught is that when you walk up to that car, you have a lot of blind zones. You have a lot of blind areas that are going, that are going on in a car, especially at nighttime. And so when you walk, when you walk up there, the thing that, that kills us and what we're taught to pay attention to are these things right here. The one, number one thing that people tell me all the time, and I'm not comfortable until I have control of these things, are the hands. These things kill you. These are the things that stab you. These are the things that can shoot you. So when I walk up to a car, and what I've told my kids to do is this, is if you get pulled over, number one, you turn, off, you turn on those interior lights in the car, turn all the lights on, roll down all the windows, put your hands on the steering wheel, and then just wait for the police officer to contact you. Uh, if I, hypothetically, if I was ever pulled over, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I was ever pulled over, and, and I, am a police, I am a police officer, I would do the same thing. I'd pull my car over, I'll turn on those interior lights, I roll electronically roll down all my windows so the police officer walking up can see the interior of that car, see that I'm not hiding anything, and know that my hands, remember these things make police officers nervous? You ever see police officers when they walk up, they ask people to put their hands back here, or they do things to take control of this? These are these things that hurt us, and we always want control of these things. I have them on the steering wheel at the top so they can clearly see where my hands are. What I don't do is that when an officer's walking up, I don't keep my tinted windows up and start reaching between my seats for my driver's license that just fell down or where my registration is. Because my alarms, when I walk up, number one, and when I'm walking up on a car that has tinted windows, it makes me a little unnervy in the first place because I can't see in. And I don't know what's going on inside, and it's very difficult for me to see. So if I come up there and I get that window down, if you're reaching between your seat, many times people hide guns between seats. Many times people put dope between seats. So there's an array of different things that could be going on that will raise my suspicions level. So there again, what I say, pull the car over, roll the windows down, turn the lights on, put your hands on the steering wheel, and just wait for the officer to ask you or to direct you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. There was a gentleman on my foot, Larry, right in front of you that had a hand up. Through. Yes, sir. You had a question, sir, with the glasses? Oh, you were just waving to say hi? We have a question on the far end before we come back over to the left. Someone raise a hand, ask a question. Well, I'll just come back over. We're going, to, we're going to get to the center. We're going to get to the center. There was a gentleman on the left-hand side here that had a question. Yes, sir. You have a question? Good evening, everybody. My name is Gary Crum. Uh, I'm from the Oliver community. My organization is, uh, oh. uh, good evening, my name is Gary Crum. I'm from the Olive community. Uh, my organization is OC250. Me and my friends started. Um, first, I want to make a statement is that uh, I don't believe we can arrest our way to safety. And, you know, 
Speaking to the mic. So that way I said I want to make a statement. The statement was that I don't believe we can arrest our way to safety. My uh, question is that um, I heard the mayor talking earlier about jobs. Um, that's the main concern in, in, in our neighborhood is that, you know, we have young men in the neighborhood that wants to get off the corner but having a hard time getting jobs because of their records. You know, I, I work for a TRF Development Company, and, you know, they gave me a chance. So, you know, I'm trying to help them do the same thing, but we need help from the city also to help, you know, build partnerships so we can get money so we can hire more people. So I just want to know what's more is being done about that. Thank you, sir. Good question. So first, Mr. Crum, thank you very much for coming out, and thank you for your question. And I agree with you. Uh, we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. Um, I, I hope you, underst you understood when I started my uh, when, I, when I started with my remarks, talking about the focus on uh, the most violent repeat offenders. And I also said that everybody you see on the, on the street isn't a suspect. Um, under my administration, we've been able to reduce uh, violence, but we are also have been doing it at the same time we've significantly reduced arrest. And even in doing so, that we've, ru we've ruffled feathers. Uh, but my commitment, uh, my personal commitment you know, I, I spent almost 10 years as a public defender. And, uh, you know, some of the people you see in this room, we were on opposite sides of the, the courtroom. And in doing so, I understood that you can help people without bringing them in front of a judge. You can help people without, you know, them being on probation. You can help people who uh, want to do better. You can meet them where they are. And that's why I continue to make investments in the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. That's why I continue to make strategic partnerships with uh, employers that, that uh, wanna, want to work and receive the certification so they can be, um, you know, they can qualify for uh, state funds for the training programs uh, as well. Because we have our um, one-stop shop career centers. We also have community job hubs. Um, you know, some of them are located in, in this community. but. I don't, even with all of those things, I don't think it's enough. So we're, we are willing to um, partner with people who have jobs and want to become certified. Uh, so we know that we're providing the best quality training for individuals. So whatever they invest their time in, it's going to help them in the long run provide for themselves and for their family. So I continue to make investments uh, in job training. We have one um, entire one-stop shop that is devoted to, uh, to individuals or dedicated to people who have been uh, previously incarcerated. We also, uh, when, and I know that, and you've probably heard it a million times, we, with the new uh, casino that's open, opening, uh, when I, when I uh, fought really hard for the expanded gaming so we could um, realize more revenue from the casino, it was clear that the, the, the legislation as, as it was originally written would lock many Baltimore residents out of that opportunity. So I worked with uh, Senator McFadden and members of the, the, the Baltimore City delegation to change the legislation to allow more people uh, to have access to those jobs, over 1,700 jobs that are being created at the casino. So we changed the legislation uh, to no longer bar people that had certain types of uh, arrests and convictions in the past. It, there was at one point, at the beginning, there was originally was a, there was, you know, they were barred from seeking employment. And because we worked with the delegation, we were able to lift that uh, restriction. And we also worked to, to ensure that um, the Horseshoe Casino made a citywide tour. So they're doing job uh, fairs in every single council district in the city. Uh, and they are, uh, in, and in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development, offering training so we can connect, again, people to jobs. We're doing that with the casino. We're doing it with Amazon jobs. We're doing it with so many different uh, people that are coming to, to Baltimore that, that want to get quality employers. We're providing that opportunity um, for them. And that's why we're getting more opportunities to create job, jobs. So whether it's the investment that I'm making in um, the, the tech jobs that are coming in, you know, with the, with the innovation economy, or it's the, in, the investments that I'm making for people who are uh, hard, 
uh, have challenges to employment, we're making those investments. And my goal is to make sure that everyone's aware of what the resources that are available and they're taking advantage of those so they can get connected to jobs. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'm going to ask Larry if you would come to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Russell, because my dear friend, and I know him, he knows me. I call him Shorty, but I'm going to let him give his name. And he's going to jump out of his seat if I don't call on him. So, Shorty, go ahead and stand up and ask your question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Give your name. My name's, my name's Shorty. Um, my question is directed at Commissioner Bats in Internal Affairs. Uh, I've been making a documentary and a movie since 2006 about the police and the politics in the state of Maryland. I gave this information to your police department prior to you coming here. And uh, I've been trying to get this information back since I won my case in 2011. Uh, my question is, how can citizens access information about and track the progress of internal affairs investigation with the Baltimore Police Department? Now, I got an interview with Officer Hill tomorrow, so that kind of answered the question, but y'all got a lot of information to turn over to me. Shorty, Shorty, come here. Come on here, man. Take my picture. Come on here. Take, <laughs> take my picture. Shorty's been trying to get a picture with me for the last several months. Every speech that I give, he shows up. He has the same statement every single time. I've answered this about 50 different times, but he has to get his message out. And, and here's your picture. Short look. Here's a picture. Smile. Smile. <laughs> I'm not going but to here's, until I get what I want. And, and, and uh, Shorty, we're going to get we're going to get what you want. Uh, I, I brought him last time. He came up to have a conversation. Is that uh, Rodney Hill is uh, our uh, internal affairs chief? And I'm going to ask Rodney that to number one, he set up a meeting with you. Uh, number two, he's going to answer the question overall and what the process is. Not Thank just, you, Shorty. Not, not just me, but any citizen. That's right. That needs this. Job. Okay, you're right. Okay, have a seat, Shorty. <laughs> Hey, Short and I have a meeting uh, scheduled for tomorrow. Got it. Okay. Um, simply the process uh, when a person makes a complaint, it's governed under the state statute. And I always make that point because it's very important for people to understand that it's not the police commissioner, it's not the mayor, it's the state statute that governs how police officers are disciplined, period. So it's nothing that the commissioner can do, it's nothing that the mayor can do, it's the state legislator that sets it, law enforcement officer bill of rights. Long and short, if a person has a complaint, you make the complaint, we investigate. I encourage, we immediately send a letter out right away letting people know that uh, your complaint has been uh, received, it's been investigated. And I tell people at meetings, I was actually, I gave a presentation to the um, Office of Public Defender on Monday in front of all their attorneys. I told them the same thing, just call my office, it's that simple. Just call, status of the complaint, if things don't go right, Say, so can I speak to Chief Hill? Okay. They may say no. One of my lieutenants and captains get it, but get the message to me. Get uh, on uh, the uh, our website. You'll, I get emails from people all the time, emails from Shorty, uh, from people all the time, and uh, I'll, your question will get answered. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Yeah, the thing I want to leave you with that as I, I sum up uh, what uh, Rodney Hill said is that we take citizen complaints very seriously. And the reason that I brought him in, the reason I brought Jerry Rodriguez in is when a citizen feels that the service that was rendered to them uh, was not appropriate or things were said to them were not appropriate, I take that ex extremely seriously. And when those, those, those go through the chain, and I make sure they go through the chain, and we investigate them extremely well, if the officers are out of line, we will hold them accountable. Now the issue is, is by state statute, is I can't tell you what that discipline is. But what I'm going to try to do is, on our website, anytime we use, for, we use force, we're going to start keeping account and tracking. We're going to put that data up on our website. I can't identify the police officers, but what we're going to start doing is giving a synopsis of the incidents that occurred. We're going to put them up on the website so you can see what they are. We're going to give you a count of what type of incidents have, are taking place and what part of our city. So as much as we can through state law, we're going to be transparent as an organization. I don't think we have anything to hide. I'm not afraid of, of showing any information, but I I do have to go by the mandates of the state law, but based on those, because police officers have rights also, and they have a police officer bill of rights that were governed by that. But we're going to do everything we possibly can to be transparent as an organization as we move forward so you know we're doing the right thing and that you are, uh, are keeping an eye on us. Thank you, sir. Now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. McGallery Park himself, Mr. Glenn Ross. It's your opportunity, sir, to pose your question 
to the mayor or commissioner, and then from there, I'm going to come back over to this side of the room, Andrea, and there's a senior citizen who introduced herself to me earlier, and I would like to get her a question. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, McGeldry Park Community Association, Northern Boundary is East Monument Street and the shopping corridor. My concern is the 23, uh, 24, 2500 block of East Monument Street. We have a open air market of drugs, uh, paraphernalia, prescription pills, CDs, you name it. It's all there. We, that also is the boundary for Eastern and Southeast Police District. We in the community know and have witnessed the good work that both districts have been doing to help clean that drug problem. Most of those people that are there are not from that community. The problem is that that community, there is a drug culture. It's a market for the drugs. Um, my concern, and, and we also appreciate the fact that we have seen the commissioner and the mayor both in this area, 9, 10 o'clock at night, not just once, but several times. So we really appreciate that. But my You're not question supposed to be telling all our business with <laughs> okay. We um, can shop on Monument Street without it being official. Okay. Uh, my, my concern is, is, is there some systematic plan? okay, to rid this area of drug and crimes because they keep coming back and forth because this helped to stop people from shopping on Monument Street. And if Monument Street does not survive, the neighborhood groups on both sides uh, do not uh, survive. Uh, very good question. It's a very good point. Uh, Monument Street will survive. Uh, one of the, the initiatives that I have overall for, for the city as a whole is that uh, we will, in our public spaces where we shop, where our families go, we will survive and we, will, we are building a plan to take back those spaces. And I've spent a tremendous amount of time, as I said, in, in, in all honesty, on Monument Street at all times of the day. During the daytime and nighttime, I was at John Hopkins today out there. I was on Monument Street uh, uh, probably about uh, 2 o'clock, so I spent a lot of time. Last, last year, we had a, we, or the year before, we had a significant problem in 2600 block of Monument, especially at nighttime. Not only drug sales, but there was a bunch, there was a number of shootings that took place, uh, especially on the south side side of Mon Monument coming out of one of those alleys. Uh, guys were uh, doing uh, uh, shootings that were over there. So that's where one of the places where we put that walking beat when we had those young officers come out of the academy. Because of the history of, of the impact that, that is there, we put officers out there. I'm going to have Keith come up here in a second and tell what he's doing over there. But I think your question is, is a, lot, a lot bigger, and I may be getting out of my lane by talking about it, is uh, we can deal, and the mayor said this, is that we can't arrest our way out of these issues. So we have to be smarter, and we have to think differently in how we solve problems overall. The violence, we're on top of that. We're dealing with the violent repeat offenders from our community. Uh, we've identified them. We know who they are. We talk, about on, we talk about them on a daily, not only a weekly, but a daily basis as a whole, and we will address that and, and hold them accountable. But you, your, your, your point is a bigger one, and it's not just for monument. It's for our city a, as a whole. It's how do we deal with the drug, the, the addiction rates within our city as a whole. And I think at some point in time, we're, we're going to have to have a larger conversation about that because that's where we're going to have to solve the problems, that we're going to have to deal with the addiction pr uh, issues. But dealing with us uh, staying in our lane, dealing with uh, what's going to what's happening out there on Monument uh, full-time, I'm going to turn it over to the Major. Keith. Thank you, sir. Uh, currently, Monument Street is kind of a unique, um, it's kind of a unique location in that it is between the Eastern and the Southeast. And essentially what we've done, we've kind of eliminated that border between the Eastern and the Southeast, and we made it an enforcement zone. It's part of my commander's zone. Currently, there's 17 zones in the city. Monument Street is one of mine. And in that zone, we've dedicated a number of resources to include uh, at least two of my operation squads. And my, my operation squads are out there with a mission, and that is to address crime, guns, and violence, and drugs. Um, right now, I have coverage up there almost 24 hours a day. Southeast also comes over. So we're going into the Southeast, Southeast is coming into the Eastern, and we're addressing a number of those uh, issues that you're concerned with. Uh, we do, we have seen a decrease, actually, in violent crime in that Miami Street area. Uh, Miami Street, it is a hub, it's a shopping hub, so there's going to be a lot of people up, uh, out, and it is uniquely situated because there's residential neighborhoods on both sides. So that foot traffic is there, but we are addressing that, and currently we do have our Miami Madison Street initiative that we're working. Uh, matter of fact, Kevin and his people are out during the daytime. Uh, we've included our portion also, so we're addressing those issues. 
Well, one of the times that I was on Monument Street, um, I, I ran into a young man out there as I was spending some time, and he said that uh, he was the king of that street and that he ruled that street and he ran that street. His name was Big Rilly, I think is, that's what they call him, Big Rilly, or Big Rilly along, along those lines. Uh, Big Rilly or Big Rilly is in prison now, so he doesn't run that street anymore. So to, to send a, a very serious message is that the citizens run that street, and we'll do that time and time again. But one of the things that uh, was brought up is what I, what I saw over the last year is a, a, along the borders, of our districts, uh, we have we had crime popping up. We had, if you look through every district between uh, the southeast to to, to the to eastern, and then from the eastern to northeast, northeast to the northern, a lot of crime were, was along the border lines throughout the city as a whole. And part of that is because we were we were we were isolating ourselves, saying this is just our district. I erased that. I said this is this patch says Baltimore City. Doesn't say Eastern, doesn't say Southeast, doesn't say Northeast, it says Baltimore Police Department. And I expect them to go over the lines and work together as a team. One of the things that we push all the time is teamwork. We're a city, we're a department together, working together. So we're cutting those seams where we have crime that's popping up. We had a discussion in Comstat today that uh, the bad guys were having a conversation about when to do crime, and you do it on the seams between the districts. Uh, and, and they're paying attention to it. So we're, re we're, we're changing those, we're erasing those lines. This is Joel DeSouza to talk about uh, overall crime within the city and uh, what he's doing with some of the drug-related issues that you were talking about. Thank you, sir. And in reference to what the commissioner just said, um, when we talk about patches and that the police think that we always thought someone's patch said Eastern District and someone's patch said Southeast District, we erase that. And a mistake that we've made for years that we've corrected now is that the two different districts, for example, Monument Street, if Monument Street's the border, the cops, the police officers in the southeast would have roll call in the southeast, and the police officers in the eastern would have roll call in the eastern. So what the majors are doing now, where we see that districts have a common boundary or a common street, the post officers that work the eastern side and the post officers that work the other side, the, east, the southeast side, they have to come together daily on all three shifts and discuss what's going on. We do that on a daily basis so nobody misses a beat. We have to be realistic that the criminals don't know the district between, the difference between the eastern and the southeast. So we're trying to stay a step ahead of them. Overall in the city, um, for years we adopted this program where we had zones, zone concepts. The past couple of years we started only with four zones citywide and we realized that when we attacked these zones and looked at the violent repeat offenders in these zones and reached out to the community in these zones and asked for help, we realized that crime was going down. So the commissioner says, why not increase from four to 17? So what we did was we increased 17 zones citywide and they're, they belong to the commanders of each district, like Major Matthew said, his commander zone. That's like his baby. So that's what we're doing, it's helping. We're monitoring that every day that we meet, every day that we talk in Comstat or on a conference calls daily, that's exactly what we talk about. What's happening in your zone? So um, the majors have a pulse on it 24 seven. Thank you, sir. We, uh, one, one more oh, please, on no, that. I'm sorry. We, we've taken that concept of the districts that have been at boundary and not crossing over. We've taken it beyond that to the city and so what we did just the other day, uh, Daryl and his boss, uh, Dean Paul Muir, called in all the, city, all the cities and counties around us. So we have Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, Howard County. We even had PG come up. Uh, and we sat down and we're starting to talk about and we're going to have a monthly meeting uh, because what we're seeing is that we have movement that's going around. It's going around in the region. It's just not uh, between districts or between cities and counties. And so what we're starting to address as a whole is sitting down on a monthly basis sharing information uh, intelligence. So we move faster, we move quicker, and that guys don't think they can draw, drive across the line and get away from us that, that we're doing it as a region to stand on top of it. And Thank as, you. As you're yes, going to the as you're going to the next question, I, mm -hmm. I just uh, want to say one thing. Um, we start. We, I know that many of you like me grew up going to public markets, whether it was Lexington Market or Hollands or, or Northeast Market. Uh, and one of the things I have done my, under my administration is to uh, reinvest in renovating the public market. So Northeast was the first one uh, that we did. So when Mr. Ross was calling me out because I like to shop over there. Um, it, it, it's 
it's beautiful. And I like the partnership that we have uh, with Hopkins and we've, you know, we've made it someplace where people want to come and, uh, you know, get together. Uh, the, the new vendors, we have a focus on tr introducing healthy food options in all of our uh, public markets. So if you see the little green leaf, you know, that's a, uh, that's a sign that the, the, the vendor is in partnership with us. And we also know, and I've spent, I spent time when I was doing my small business tour to try to c encourage everybody to shop local during the holidays. I spent some of my time on uh, Monument uh, Street, and I fell in love with one of the little shops over there. It was a uh, young woman who's a graduate of City College who has a, a, a boutique over there that's very nice. And I think I will say I do not know of a better half and half than I've had. At, I think, what's it called, Sunshine? Is that what it's called? I would like to find a better one because I grew up on the, on the west side, so I would like to think that the west can represent with a half and half, but they have real fruit in there, so I don't know if we, I'm looking for the, the challenge uh, while I go back over there, but that's why you keep seeing me over there because I found some shops that, that, you know, that keep dragging me back. So it, when we're not done. We're going to continue this work so we can support those. Uh, many of those businesses have been there for years and, and want to be there, so we have to be there in partnership so they can continue to thrive. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And we had uh, a young lady who I met coming in uh, who shared with me that she's a senior citizen who lives in the district. She wanted to give a question or comment. I can't remember, but please, uh, you can pose your question. Give us your name first, and Good you can evening, pose your question. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mrs. Glenn, Lucy Lee Glenn, and I live in uh, the Association Ashland Park Muse, Condo 2. And I'm right down there off of everything. Miami Street, Eagle Street, and Somerset, uh, Latrobe Projects, and Gay Street. I'm 82 years old, and I have nine head of kids, 60-some grandchildren. I'm very, very independent, and y'all look out for me, and I want to thank everybody from the mayor to Eastern District, the city council, everybody look out for me. But one thing I do have is my, right here, thank you. I have to go out of my district to go to the food market up there at Giants. I have to go all the way out to, um, what is this new market opened up, came out of New Jersey. <laughs> Shop, right. And I have to get my food, bring it in here, my oldest son. I'm a very independent woman. I don't eat no garbage. Yes, I didn't eat it when it was hard times and Gay Street. I want to know what is all of y'all going to do about Gay Street? I have another question after this. Do you want to give me both of your questions? Pardon? What, give me both of your questions. Both of my questions? I live across from the Troll Project. Here go the pictures. I have called. Councilman Young, I've called Councilman uh, Carl Stokes, and that mayor, uh, that uh, lady that came in when we had a meeting up to INT, I'm right across from INT, I live in my home, and I'm, uh, my home is paid for. And I'm not trying to leave out of the city to go into county, as you say, you got uh, county trouble all around. I live across from that Latrobe Project. Mrs. Johnson, is the, um, she's the um, management. Mr. Wilcox took care of everything. Now she lied and said that she was gonna have everything to meet us. That street has got two years of leaves laying up there, the snow is gone, the tree's gonna start blossoming, and cats and rats, when you come home, is in that gutter taking his private urinating and everything, the rats is out there. I feel as though that that street, now here's how it looked when Mr. Wilcox was right there, they knew right there. It was clean. There's IND. IND helps to take care of that neighborhood. Just because it's a project, I lived in the project during World War II in Somerset, and we kept it clean. <laughs> So I don't know what they got over there that they can't keep that place clean. It is right there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. 
Do you have the pictures with the trash, Ms. Glenn? Are those the ones we're coming? These are the ones with the trash? I got it. No, no, I got the before. I got. I needed the after. And Madam uh, Mayor, if it's okay, I just wanted them to give Ms. Glenn another round of applause for, as we say in West Baltimore, we're in these, she's still representing on the food piece. Being a vegetarian, I'm glad to hear that you're still eating healthy food. Go ahead, Madam. So, uh, Ms. Glenn, first, thank you for being here. It's very important that I hear from, from you. And, you know, one of the, the things that I've been uh, active and very vocal, not just in Baltimore, but nationally, is on access to fresh and healthy food in our community. Uh, we were the first city in the nation to hire a, a food czar, our food policy director, someone who, who did an assessment of all of the neighborhoods and what access, uh, what access there was or was not for fresh and healthy food. And we identified the areas where we had food deserts and we put into uh, play something called the virtual supermarket where we partnered uh, with, a, uh, with a local supermarket. And if you went to certain libraries, senior centers, or some DSS officers partnered with us and a few schools, you could go online, you could put your, your order in, and it was particularly helpful for individuals that were using the SNAP benefits because you, know, the, you, couldn't use the, you can't use the SNAP online. But because of that partnership for the virtual supermarket, you could use it online, just like Peapod or those other food delivery services. And you were, you were able to get access to fresh and healthy food. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, later on this year uh, reintroducing the virtual supermarket. We have a new partner, and we're going to be unveiling that later in the year, because it's very important. It's, no, no, two, two different things. So this is about no matter where you live, uh, we have we have hubs, we have places where you can go, even if you don't have a supermarket, where you can go, you can place your order, you can either do it on home if you have access to the internet at home, or you go to uh, certain libraries, you put your order and the food is... No, I... So, Ms. Glenn, with, with no disrespect, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that, you know, you, you, you seem more independent that you, or, or certainly better, better equipped to pick out the vegetables and fruits than, than I do. But what I'm saying is, in, until we can get more supermarkets, more standalone supermarkets, what I've done is understanding that there is that problem, try to stand in the gap until we can get those markets. Because I don't think it's enough to say, you know, in two years or in five years, we think there's going to be a supermarket here. What are we going to do in the meantime? We are, and then, so we're we're going to reintroduce the the virtual supermarket, uh, so you can you can have access to fresh and healthy food. We're, what we're, we're also doing is a couple other things, is uh, we are working with certain corner stores, because that right now there is a there is a movement not just in Baltimore but many cities around the country uh, that urban agriculture. So people are turning vacant lots into uh, to agriculture, you know, to, to farm plots and they're growing fresh fruits and vegetables. And we're also working with certain corner stores that we, we know that, you know, while there's a shortage of uh, real grocery stores, we have an overabundance of corner stores. And we're trying to connect, you know, to make those a resource to the community. So connect with... So Gay Street, the Old Town Mall is, a, is another issue. Uh, we did put out a request for proposals for, for Gay Street prior to the recession. And we had people interested. But once the economy, the bottom fell out of, uh, on the economy, so did their proposal. So what we are doing is working in, in two different ways. Some, some of the work is some demolition that is overdue that is going to happen. And we put, I, I invest, put money in this year's budget. No, I know, no, no, I know. Look, I've cleaned up many a mess that I didn't, that I didn't. 
Right. I know. I'm not. I, but you know what I say? It, it might not be my mess, but it's not my daughter's mess either. So I'm going to fix it before it gets to, to where our, our kids are have to held responsible for it. So we are, we're putting the RFP back out. We're doing some demolition and clearing up the site so we can uh, make it more uh, attractive for investment. And we're hoping that we're going to, we, we got some nibbles, but until we do some of the work that we need to do, we're not, we, we don't think we're going to get the, the investment that we think we need in that area. Thank you, Madam. I got, I got all the pictures. I'm going to talk to uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Anthony Scott, who's over HABC, and we're going to make sure that it gets cleaned up. Right, look, I, I don't, you don't like it, I don't like it. All right. Thank you, Ms. Claire. Thank you very much. Give her a round of applause. Real <laughs> Madam Mayor, before we go to where Larry is, a question, young lady who had her hand up, she moved over to the far right, and I'm coming to you just next. Then we'll go back to Charlene. I would like to Thank announce two things. One, uh, Mr. Her where's Harry Spikes, the second. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Harry joined us uh, on Saturday. Harry is a special assistant to Congressman Cummings. And forgive me for uh, not mentioning you earlier. It's good to see you. Why don't you give him a round of applause here, representing Congressman Cummings. And then next. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Russell, uh, Ms. Glenn, I'll just, he would like to speak to you afterwards. He's willing uh, to volunteer some services and making sure she gets what she needs to the market, from the market. Um, he even mentioned Church Square, uh, market up at Church Square. Also, April 26th is the mayor's citywide cleanup. There's a crew that we will make sure well before the 26th because we have Ms. James here from DPW who will address that issue. We have the photos now. Coming to you, ma'am, in the red. Yes, you had your hand up and you moved over, so I'll be fair. And then I'm coming back to Miss Bourne, and then we'll get Miss in the back. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Diane Williams, and I'm an Oliver resident. I'm a born East Baltimorean. Um, I have concerns with the youth. Um, I noticed we talked about all the crimes, we talked about all other stuff, but nobody addressed the youth. I look in this room. We all are grandparents here. We had no young parents here to be addressed how their child should behave or how we should address their child, whether we're in uniform or we're just a resident walking the street. Um, OC 250, I understand, is uh, trying to work with the young people. Um, the, the jobs are needed to work with those young people. Um, I, is a lot of young kids in the city that's the repeaters that grows up to be an adult system. I addressed this issue to your state's attorney, and he can't do anything because he only deal with adult um, crime. So we need somebody on board to work with these young people to guide them in a better direction, such as when I was coming up down in the projects, we had those things. Um, a lot of the kids are disrespectful, but they only learn it from home. So we need to be able to address their young parents, talk to them. I have that um, personality that I can relate to them. I can talk to the parents. And I have respect in my community with the young people as far as the parents and the children. Also, I have a problem with, my next question is, the bulk trash, the illegal dumping, I am a complainer. They probably know me at 311. Uh, my last number was 221427. Uh, <laughs> I live in, right now, I, and God's great bless me to go further, but right now I live in the um, Landval Canal Courts. The management is really disrespectful to their tenants and also to the illegal dumping when it's reported to them. At that time, I give them that notice, and then I have to call the city. <clears throat> For the um, April the 26th cleanup, I would really like to see, uh, I know it's all about volunteering, and I don't have a problem with that, but just to try to get some jobs started, maybe some of those people are looking for work, start it off with that and, and be able to give them some kind of stipend, you know, 
once a month or something just to help to keep the city clean. Because all around Enza Street, Holbrook, behind March Funeral Home, through the alleys. I mean, I walk the streets of Baltimore like the policemen do for, as a trash advocate. So um, I see these things. And, and I think that's where we need some jobs at to help keep our city clean and help keep the crime down. So first, again, thank you for the, for the question and for coming out uh, this evening. So I'll back it, I'll, I'll try to remember all your, your questions. I'll back up to the, the, the jobs piece. One of the things that I did was to develop a partnership with one of our local companies to fund a Clean Up Baltimore competition, where we have, um, many of you remember, like Afro Clean Block, you know, and that was a lot of pride. I don't even remember if there was money attached to it. I just knew people were, people were, yeah, but you know, it wasn't, it was, it was, it was having that designation. You know, it was having, being able to say that you were a clean black. That was, to me, what I thought was most important than, I didn't know, I, I never knew there was money attached to it. I just knew it was important. That's what I'm saying. So, but, but I, I know the pride that came along with that designation and communities coming together to clean up. So I challenged my DPW director to come up with something, uh, s something that would, be, would, would speak to communities today. So we came up with the Clean Communities Campaign. And I mention that because, because of the award, I think it's for the winner, it's either 4,000 for the community association, it's either $4,000 or $5,000 to the winning association. What they're able, what communities are able to do with that is to provide stipends for, you know, for, for workers that they want to designate that, to help clean up or any other things uh, that, that they can do. You know, for me, part of what we're doing is trying to, uh, to collaborate and create partnerships so communities can, have opportunities to do, you know, to, to have resources to do with them what they will, right? So we do have that clean communities uh, campaign uh, that is going, that has gone on for the past two years that gives communities opportunity to uh, come together to clean up and, and to win uh, money on, on for that. With respect to, you had a question about the juveniles? Yes. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge, um, you know, we, we're in a different time right now. Um, I know that when I grew up, if an adult said something, if, if, if I was acting some sort of way and somebody saw it and told my parents, my parents checked me before they checked the person who gave them the information. But now we're in a time where the, the, the parents are more likely to, to curse the person out who told them than to correct their child. So we, we, we are, we have a lot of work to do. And part of it is work that we can do, that I can do in the city. We have the, I talked, one of the things I talked about in my state of the city was our youth connection centers that are going, that, that's working to connect uh, young people that are clearly in distress, the ones that are out on the street after curfew. I've, with my heart broken, I've seen children as, as, uh, small, as young as seven and eight years old out on the street, one at two o'clock in the morning, unsupervised. So part of that is, is taking that model that we have just in the summer, the curfew center, and making it youth connection centers that we can keep all year round to uh, help identify those young people that would otherwise fall through the cracks. So I'm, I'm, we're, we are uh, working to create those. Uh, but it's two, it also is, um, you know, I, wish, I wish the city had all of the answers to that. Uh, be, but but we don't. We, we we also have to figure out as a community how we are going to help those parents who didn't learn any better themselves. Um, so that's a, that's a whole bigger uh, discussion. So we are doing that, and, and we're also looking for ways to connect with young people and and, and uh, you know just to to speak to them where they are. So one of the things I introduced a couple of weeks ago was the Be More Night Hoops. Uh, and it's a night basketball league, and it's um, a range of ages. Uh, but, w but in order to try to, to, to close that gap, uh, we are, it's not just basketball. It's a lot of the soft skills and the job readiness stuff you have to do for an hour before you can uh, participate in a night hoop. So we can try to connect some of the young people who didn't have the benefit of the upbringing that many of us have had uh, to, to connect them so they don't fall through the cap. Do the crap. Um, 
and 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 it's and for years since I came on the council um, in '95, um, and I uh, council well. I'll, I'm dating myself, I've been there the longest, but you know, the, the, the amount of resources that have gone to recreation and parks has uh, diminished. Um, and one of the things that I've worked on under my administration was to try to right size recreation and parks and develop a capital investment plan so we're able to open the, the uh, more state of the arts, larger uh, centers with extended hours and increased uh, staffing. And, and create recreation, recreation centers that people actually want to go to. And we've done, we've started, we've cut ribbons on a few, but there, and there's certainly more to come. Wait a minute, don't, 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 okay, go ahead. But I, I, you had two more things I wanted to speak to. Mm -hmm. Oliver Community at the Oliver Community Association Center. Yeah, so I want you to know that we're taking a look at that facility as well as others throughout uh, throughout the city to try to figure out where we can uh, build on the assets we have to bring more uh, resources and programming to the community. So we're not we don't have a difference of opinion in in the the sense that there, we can do more with that. I also want to say a few more things about the. The, um, you talked about trash and you all, illegal dumping. You also talked about juveniles. We also continue to invest in opportunities for young people through youth works and uh, expanding opportunities. So part of it, yes, a lot of kids, I, I did it myself. You know, one of my first job opportunities was uh, a youth works type program. And I, I worked for the state and I cleaned up the parks and you get some skills. But uh, I think it's important for, for young people to have a, a you know, a wide breadth of opportunities. So we've been working with our corporate partners to, tr to work to create opportunities so they have different experiences. So it's not just cleaning up in the parks or, you know, working in a, in a rec center or making photocopies, but they're, they're getting other opportunities. So that's something that's very important to me and that is growing every year, the number of uh, companies that are participating in the, in the Hire One uh, Baltimore program. Two other things. You talked about illegal dumping, and uh, besides the, the uh, 26 uh, cameras that we have throughout the city that are uh, strictly focused on illegal, uh, historic illegal dumping sites that have uh, gotten us um, many uh, convictions each year, uh, we also work through the legislative session to increase the penalty for illegal dumping, and the, the, le the legislation was passed, so um, it, you, you will get points on your license. Uh, if you are uh, if you are convicted, so if there's a, a vehicle attached to the illegal dumping, um, you will you know you that uh, because of that you will get the points on your license, and that will you know help us deter uh, illegal dumping e even more. And another thing uh, that's going to help us keep our city cleaner is the citywide street sweeping. Um, we started that earlier this month, and uh, we're bringing something that has been successful in some of our business districts throughout the city, we're bringing that into the neighborhoods and we're doing the uh, street sweeping. It's going to help us uh, to keep our, our neighborhoods clean as well as our streams and, and waterways. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. Now, Ms. Bourne, I know that I asked that we go to you next, but because 845 was actually our cutoff time, I'm going to do what's called a speed through real quick. I'm not breaking any laws, Commissioner. I'm just <laughs> speed through in dialogue. There are a couple folks who had their hands up, and we're going to go one, two. Actually, we have about time for probably two more questions. I want us to be mindful. There's a little sidebar. There's a, there are a few sidebar conversations, and I just want to remind everyone that we are to respect, allow time for a response, and look for or even suggests the need for certain resources. There's a gentleman, 
Now, I'm not sure, because Ms. Glenn, you pointed and said, my son. I don't know, but there's a gentleman here next to you. OK, you had your hand up earlier, and you were kind enough to defer to Ms. Glenn. I'll give you the opportunity, sir. You introduce yourself, and you can introduce the young man, if this is your son. Pose your question, Jeremiah. And then we'll go to Ms. Hall. Ms. Where'd she go? In the glass, yes. You're next. I was about to say, let's the know gentleman that. here on the end, and then we're done. Yes, sir. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. One second. Again, respect, response, resource. I'm gonna let you go. Thank you, sir. Give him the mic. Thank you. I'm Gimariah Griffin's father. Okay. And um, I just want to say thank you to Commissioner Batts and to the mayor for your support and uh, efforts in the community. I'm um, just in from policing and uh, paying attention. You guys are definitely paying attention. So um, those efforts are definitely appreciated. I live in the community. I've lived in Patterson Park. I've lived in Reservoir Hill. I've lived in Bolton Hill. I currently live in Park Heights. I know it's not East Baltimore, but I grew up in East Baltimore. They are the same white shirts that you see, not the white shirts, white T-shirts that you see on corners. Public safety is very important to me. So I, I'm hoping that uh, you guys have a Facebook page and a Twitter page, and you guys pay very close attention to the things that people post there anonymously. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. With yes, ma'am. Stan, give us your name. No, please. We we wanted you to speak in the mic. We can give you the opportunity to speak into the mic so we can hear you. My name is Dora Tapp, and what I want to talk about is Baltimore City. Period. It's ugly itself away. You drive through Baltimore City, all these these houses, the vacant houses, the trash, the dirt, and then you say you're gonna bring 10,000 families into here, you're gonna to have to do a lot of cleaning up. Because Baltimore City has ugly itself away. And it used to be such a beautiful city. A beautiful city with white steps and marble steps and beautiful trees. I know, I used to, we used to have clean block, just like they said. But you, you need to do something for the inner city and stop doing everything for Canton, Fells Point, and Federal Hill. Thank you, ma'am. So thank you very much for uh, your comments. And, and that's the reason why I expanded the street sweeping in the community, because I, I see the same thing that you see, and that we need help in many communities. And that's why we expanded it, and we are taking it across to every, every single. We're doing that. It's not either or. It's not either or. It's, I, I agree. You, yes, we are holding the residents uh, responsible, but we're also investing and using the resources that we have to expand the street sweeping. Something that I, I said before is something that we've seen has been successful in helping us to control, um, you know, the 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 dirt and the the debris and everything that comes with that in the. For years and years, falling apart. That belonged to the city, but that's in the black people's neighborhood, so you don't have to do nothing about that. You so, don't do anything about it. So, that's so, first of all, uh, with respect to cleaning up. I agree, and that's why we've we've take we've expand. I have expanded um, the street sweeping that is going to significantly, um, I believe, help use the resources that we have as a city to do more than clean the business district. It's going into the neighborhoods and cleaning the streets in our communities, and my hope is that it will make Baltimore cleaner. Um, with respect to the the vacant the vacant uh, buildings, um, I share your frustration, and that is why one of the first things I did as mayor was task uh, my housing commissioner to develop a initiative that would address uh, the, the problem that we have with, with uh, vacant uh, homes. When I talk about growing the city, it's not just about attracting new people at all. It's about doing things that uh, we know need to happen to keep families here. We're not gonna grow uh, the city just by attracting people. We have to stop people from moving out. That's why I fought like hell 
for the over $1 billion in the school construction money because what I know is people don't want to send their children to schools that are run down. They don't want to send their children to schools where you can't drink from the water fountain. You can't send your children to the bathroom where when it rains the, the ceilings are leaking and they can't see out of the buildings. That's why I fought so hard because just like what we saw this, uh, this afternoon at Waverly with a brand new you know, floor to ceiling, brand new school, when you build brand new schools, you build hope uh, in communities. And it's not just one school that's coming. It's more than 15 brand new ground to, to ceiling uh, schools that are coming to the, to the city, as well as at least 35 fully renovated schools uh, that are coming to the city. And we are working uh, with the school system to get some of those buildings that have been closed surplus so we can get them back in, um, in active use. And you talked about the the uh, vacant prop the vacant prop property and and what's happening and what's not happening. I talked about the, what one of the first things I did when I became mayor is the vacant to the va vacant to value initiative. I'm very proud of the work that I've that I've done in uh, eliminating blight. By um, I have uh, torn down more blighted uh, vacant properties that have been done under uh, past administrations. I've created incentives to to bring homeowners into some of our most challenged neighborhoods through the Vacants to Value Home, uh, Home Buyers Initiative program. We're citing, just like you said, to hold the residents accountable. We're citing absentee landlords who have purchased property as speculation and haven't done anything with it. And, and because of those citations, we've gotten um, millions, many millions of dollars in private investment in, in those uh, buildings. The, the, the problem is when we're doing things in the neighborhood, unless you drive by it, you don't know. But everybody sees what's going on, um, the, the big things that are going on, and they think that's the only thing. It's not. We're working all across the city in many different ways to make those investments in the neighborhood. It's not with the fanfare because the press doesn't, the, you know, the press doesn't care about it. And I try to talk about it as much as possible. But unless you see it on your, you know, on your day-to-day -day journey, you don't know either what we're doing. But I, my investments are very firmly within neighborhoods. The, the vacant buildings that are coming down and the homeowners that are coming into the neighborhoods is intentional uh, because I believe that uh, we have to we have to number one you know in, in, entice people and, and give incentives for people to to come back to those neighborhoods as well as uh, support the community with things like new schools and cleaner streets to get them to stay here Thank you madam mayor and because we are now at 858. Uh, we were to conclude at 845, but because you're my boss, we we're going to allow you to continue to respond to at least one more. Miss, there were two people that came in, Madam Mayor. That was Miss Glenn, and there was a gentleman who he's going to introduce himself. He's vision impaired, and because he was actually here early, asked if he could ask a question, I'm going to defer to him. If you would just introduce yourself, sir. And before you do, before you do, so that some of our neighbors who are in the room do not get restless, Again, you have in your hand, as we did at the Western, a document that you can fill out. There are pens downstairs if you don't have a pen, where you can write your information down, write your question, and those who, I don't know who was in the room from the last uh, forum, but I personally called those who asked for a phone call from the survey. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity to fill out the forms, there's a table downstairs for surveys. You can leave information. There are police officers in the next room. Those of you who would like to speak with an officer off camera and not in the sight of others, I'm going to allow the gentleman uh, who is about to introduce himself to pose his question. I'll allow the, the mayor and the commissioner to give an answer, give closing remarks, and then we will conclude for the night. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good, good evening, commissioner. And, uh, Ms. Mayor, uh, good citizenship begins with uh, parenting and guidance from both parents. And uh, right now, uh, mom in, in most of these households is the head of the family. And I'd like to know if the police can get dad back into the family. Instead of filling our prisons up, let's start emptying them. Let's start bringing those dads out of prison, put them back in the family, uh, put them back to uh, working. And I've suggested this before to uh, 
some of the politicians here in the company in the city and they say, no, that's impossible, we can't get involved in that. But when violence became an issue against women, the courts got involved and the police got involved with the abusers and things started to change. So let's try to get dads back into the family and instead of uh, filling our prisons up, let's start emptying them because I voted for President Obama. I thought he was the best man for the job and he said we need to make new changes and stop doing things in the old way. He said, but don't expect me to come up with all the answers. You folks have got to work and start making these changes and help me. Thank you, sir. I, I think your statements and your questions are, are very uh, profound. Uh, I, I think um, as I've uh, grown up in law enforcement for uh, uh, 33 years, you know, what I've watched uh, over those three decades is how we in law enforcement have done policing. And uh, in the 1990s, whether it was on the West Coast or the East Coast, policing was the same, is that uh, we, we were focused on making large arrests within communities. And that was, that was a genre, that was the, th the, the theory at that point in time. And so we went into these communities in an effort to, to stem the rock cocaine impact within the communities, and we arrested people. You know, one, of the, one, one day I was sitting down by myself in this other organization uh, that I was in charge of, and I, and I had time by myself just thinking about the strategies and the things that we were doing. What I started paying attention to is, what is, uh, can I have your attention just for a second, because uh, there's too much side comments, comments going on? Um, what I was thinking of is what was my responsibility to these communities and what I was feeling inside myself, and this was a personal comment and I'm just going to be very open, is that I, I was responsible for large numbers of males going to prison. I was responsible for it because I was given in that direction and we were making large numbers of arrests within these communities. Now as we were doing that <clears throat> with the goodness of our heart, trying to do the right thing, we were also crippling communities for a long time. For decades, we're crippling communities as a whole. Today, what we're trying to do, and I say it pretty openly, and I say it to my command staff, is that what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build a police department is one that brings hope, one that brings uh, an asset to the community, and not trying to cripple or hurt a community as a whole. So we will do everything we possibly can as we change and evolve as a police organization to add to the community and not take, take away. I can't put males back into families. I can't, construct, I can't construct families that are falling apart. I don't have the power to do that. I wish I did. I understand what you're trying to communicate, and I think you're right, you're right on. However, I also look at my own, my own life, and that's where I always go back to. I wasn't, my dad wasn't in the household. I had a very strong mom. Uh, who raised me, and it was a different time. I was wearing platform shoes, a big afro, and looking at Soul Train. Uh, but at nighttime, we had fried bologna sandwiches. I mean, that's what we had to eat. We were struggling uh, to, to make it. And then my mom, working two or three jobs, she was out there and she kept me on the right plane. So it's not always a male, but what she did, she was the head of that household, and she was very strong, and our black females in our communities have been around for a long time and have raised families and have done a great job. I think what, what also came into play is that she had all other role models, models who were males who came into impact in my life. And some of those role models wore uniforms. And that's that impact, you can see that long-term men, mentoring impact that has impacted my life. <clears throat> now, what we said earlier, and I'm reconnecting this to a conversation the lady said earlier, is that um, I, don't want to, I don't feel comfortable going out here talking to some of these teen, teenagers, and I can understand that. You know, some of the teenagers out here are a little rough and, a little, and, and disrespectful at times. I go up to them all the time. Even when they don't like police officers, I'm going up to them all the time. I make them talk to me. And I start, when I start a conversation and we're having a conversation, those barriers come down, and I tell them, I'm not here to disrespect you. I just want to have a conversation to you. And I don't expect you guys to do that if you don't feel comfortable. But this is, here's another issue. If, you, if these young people in our schools today, in our city, these young people who we're raising and we're growing up, if they can't read by the third grade, there is a high probability they're not even going to make it through high school. And if they can't make it through high school, they're going to run into people like me and we're going to have those impacts, right? I mean, you may not be able to impact those young teenagers out there, but you can impact a five-year-old. You can impact a six-year-old. You can impact a seven-year-old. And for kids being able to read and from a standpoint of just literacy, right. literacy, 
being able to read a Dr. Seuss book is something important. If we take one hour out of our busy weeks, one hour out of our busy weeks to dedicate to a child, those are the impacts that can make a difference. You may, not put, you may not be able to put that dad back into that family, but you could be saving just by that little act of mentoring, giving your time, not looking at that football game, not looking at that basketball game, but giving your one hour out of that week to mentor that child, you can make a difference. Thank you very much. So again, I know that there are several people who have, had, have questions, and I know that uh, we made an agreement with the host of this thing to be out by now, and we're not. Um, so if you, uh, if you want to continue to uh, raise your hand, well, I can connect you with our Mayor's Office of Employment, I mean, not Employment, Neighborhoods, to get the question so you can get the answers to the question, because we do have uh, a time constraint. I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming out uh, this evening. I want to thank you for uh, working with us uh, as we try to get as many questions answered as possible. Uh, I want to thank our uh, CRC uh, president and community leaders for helping us to get the word out, for being here, and all of the agencies uh, that participated. This is uh, certainly not the end of the conversation. I hope this is an ongoing uh, conversation as we strive to work together better uh, for a safer Baltimore. So thank you all very, very much, we say. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, everyone.